look at some of this video of one of the great pitchers of the late 70s up to 1980, back-to-back -back 300 strikeout seasons. J.R. Richards, 6'8", 220, was absolutely dominant on the mound. And we are so excited right now, Joel, Joel Goldberg, Jeff Montgomery, to be joined by the great J.R. Richard. He's in town. He's going to be signing books and speaking with folks at the Negro Leagues Museum tomorrow. Uh, the book, Still Throwing Heat, Strikeouts, The Streets, and A Second Chance. Great to have you here in Kansas City. How much do you enjoy being able to come here going over to the Negro Leagues Museum? I'm loving it. Uh, I always have admired the Negro Museum every time I come here. And uh, you can't meet an individual no better than uh, the director himself. Right, Bob Kendrick. And for, and for you, you know, there's obviously a great story to tell. I want to go back to, to 1980, one of the dominant pitchers in baseball. You'd have back-to-back -back 300 strikeout seasons, but you weren't during that season feeling right. Tell us what was going on. Well, I was, the, what come to the conclusion was that I had a, they call it a thoracic syndrome. I let in, in layman terms, it's a simple blood clot. And uh, the doctor told me that I was such a, a powerful pitcher that my muscles in my right shoulder had overdeveloped. But getting back to your questions, I had uh, complained to the Astros for maybe a month or more about I'm not feeling well, something is wrong. And I couldn't pinpoint it myself about what, what was wrong. But as I uh, found out later on, I didn't have one stroke, I had three strokes. So. It was, render, it was really a hindrance, and uh, which kind of go to show what, how much they felt about one of their star sports to be ball players. Jerry, I grew up watching a lot of National League baseball, watching you pitch a lot during those 70s. And one thing I was always amazed about, you obviously were a very big man, but your hands were so large. The baseball actually kind of looked like it was a ping pong ball or a golf ball size in your hand. How were you able to control baseball with such large hands? Well, having large hands at that time was an asset, and I had learned over the, over the years to control it. And uh, matter of fact, with large hands, you put extra movement on the baseball. Well, let's just see here real quick. Let's measure up those hands. And um, that's, yeah, I mean, that's some of the biggest hands that I have ever seen. And, you know, JR, going back to that time, I mean, you were one of the greats in baseball. And then I know you went on the disabled list. You would come out of a game after a few innings reading this in your book, and, and you didn't quite feel right. And people were wondering, there's a shot to deep right field, and that is going to be gone. Preston Tucker, who has been hot lately, has three home runs already this week, goes deep. So it is one nothing as Jeremy Guthrie lamenting that one. But you go on the disabled list, 21-day DL, I think, back then. And on a, on a day where you come in, the team's out of town, you end up having that stroke T take us through that day and what you remember well that day was uh as, as far as i can remember the team was getting ready to go out of town on a road trip that day and i was pitching with a friend of mine named wilbur howard i was working out and it was a lie a, a loud high-pitched tone ringing in my left ear which i never thought anything about it. i just shook it off and kept it on then and a few minutes later on my equilibrium was off. I couldn't stand up. So I said, well, what in the world is going on with myself, talking to myself like that? And then all of a sudden, I laid down on Astrodome floor, and Wilbur Howard come in and said, kept putting cold tides on my forehead, saying, are you all right? Are you all right? And I'm saying to myself, now, what in the world do you think? So that's basically how it had, had, uh, had happened, I think. But what, is, what it started in Chicago, Illinois. And if, if I would have been such a valuable asset to the ball club, why wasn't I taken to the doctor in Chicago, Illinois? That makes you think. People don't really give, care about you. They just love you for what you do. That's it. Right, and reading in your book, a lot of your teammates were wondering, wait a minute, what, what's with this guy? And in, in the world of baseball or sports, sometimes it's, you know, get out there and, and grind through it, yet there was so much more going on with you. Well, it's a bandwagon type thing. Everybody want to jump on a bandwagon and say, okay, and say, okay, this is right, this is what's wrong. But I always say this, if you know you're right, if I know I'm, you're right, why argue with somebody about it? It's not going to prove more. It's just stay with the facts. You know what you know, because don't, don't nothing in the world, nobody in the world know their body better than you. But another thing I want to break up, it's amazing that I have to come to uh, Kansas City, Missouri, to get a baseball team to talk about my book, and I played the Houston Astros right there in time. 
Right, well, I mean, we're thrilled to have you here, Monty. Yeah, and I think, Jared, just learning about your story after your baseball career, you went through some very difficult times, and the fact that you're back on track with your life. Step us through a little bit about what you've been through. Well, that time, I think those times, I'm going to say it like this, those times is good to me because I got a chance to meet God and instead of put... Because a lot of times I was... When I was playing baseball, I was professing God, but I wasn't, I didn't possess God. Now I got a chance to possess him. And you know, sometimes God want to get you and get you by yourself so he can have your undivided attention. And that was the case. He wanted to get my attention. So he did get your attention. And here you were. You'd made some money, but life isn't always easy for folks after baseball. It had been taken away from you. And in reading in the book, and the story's been out there, of course, that that you were bouncing from friend's house to friend's house, didn't have any money left, felt like maybe, you know, you'd worn out your welcome in some places. For those that don't know the story, tell us, as you talk about being alone with God, tell us where you were living at that one point um, after living with friends. Well, I was staying at the, at the Beach Nut at 59 and Beach Nut, there under the bridge. But through it all, the, regardless of what had happened, life still goes on. The sun doesn't stop because you, you fell down on your bottom now. The, the day of the day, the next day of the day after. Life keep time and life keep going on. So it's up to you to get up. You get up and live. You learn how to get up and live, or you learn how to lay down and die. And now you're an active minister um, and, and very active in the uh, community in the Houston area, correct? Yes, I am because I'm at the point where I'm trying to give back, give people, give you know, give back to the community. And tell some, somebody about the way to go or the thing to do so it will not happen to you. But see, most people don't really even realize it, but they are one or two paychecks from being homeless themselves. From one of the best in the major leagues to not too soon afterwards being homeless to back and living a good life. Folks can go see J.R. Richard tomorrow at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. We're thrilled to have you here in Kansas City. Thanks for sharing your story. I enjoyed it. Appreciate it very much, sir. All right, guys, that is J.R. Richard. You guys remember one of the great, dominant, hard-throwing pitchers of the late 70s.